for our last speaker of the morning, we have Randy James. And Randy James, actually, he comes all the way from Manhattan as well. He is a practicing and a consulting arborist from Manhattan, Kansas. He's the owner of two small businesses, Growing Concerns Incorporated, that's a lawn and tree firm, and uh, Tree Bio uh, Biologics, that's a tree consulting firm as well. He received his BS in horticulture and MS in plant pathology from Kansas State University and has published research on the prevention of pine wilt nematode in the scientific journal of arboriculture. And today he's going to talk about uh, tree protection, but he's also going to talk about what it entails to be an arborist. So welcome, um, welcome Randy. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I saw you sitting there. I'm like, where is you? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, quite a drive in from Manhattan this morning. Anybody else make that? Left at 5.30 in the fog. Never did lift. Uh, crazy. Anyway, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Tree protection is... Uh, I don't, know, I don't know how familiar you are with tree protection. Maybe you're confused about the title. Um, but I, I'm just going to run through a bunch of slides. My goal is just to pump a bunch of slides so you can see visually what's involved with uh, tree protection. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll start with maybe just this first picture. This is my daughters. I'm proud of my daughters. You know, they're great kids, I mean, as far as kids go. But uh, this one off to the left, uh, you know, my kids have been subjected to tree stuff for about 20 years now you know the oldest one's 21 and somewhere along the way you know in my preaching because i have a tendency to get a little preachy when we start about talk about trees my uh my next one my one off to the side here kind of kept coined this phrase and i have to say it right oh wow you know that's what she says so now whenever i start talking about trees now the other ones have picked it up so a lot of times i'll start if i go a little too far they'll say oh wow dad usually but you guys don't have to say that but i'll give you that option so if we if i start getting off and you know if this guy's a little nuts then you can go ahead and say that and i won't be insulted okay everything's fine okay i want to just start by and i thought it was great i think it was eric was talking about horticulture it is a tremendous career you know i have some friends um and it's funny how he'd mentioned that you're not before obscure people I have a lot of really rich friends and uh, they all they all because of being involved in tree protection. And they have trees and they want them protected. So, you know, what's, there's only one thing best, but better than being rich, I think, is having rich friends, right? So it's worked. You know, I, I've gone on some uh, fly fishing trips with them, and I've gone on a couple flights to Taos, New Mexico, in their plane, which is pretty cool, and a lot of different things. But you know what I come back from every time is they're talking about their careers. You know, some own multiple car dealerships, and some of them are uh, commercial estimator, um, appraisers, I'm sorry, real estate people. I mean, just go down the line, every single one, attorneys, doctors, dentists. But I always come back from these trips because we talk about life. You know, we have a Thursday morning coffee, and we talk about our business. And I always think to myself, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade my career for theirs. Not on a second, not in a second. And it's interesting, they wouldn't trade with me either. <laughs> They're the ones with the plane, right? You know, because Randy doesn't have anything. But I just, I love it, and I love the career. And if you're, if you're drawn to it, I think it's incredible. It's an incredible uh, industry, and you can do incredible things. Uh, there's a quote uh, by William Barclay. I don't know if you're familiar with it. He's a Christian writer. But he says, you know, there's two great days in a man's life. And it could be a woman's life. The day he or she was born, that's a pretty good day, right? And the day they discover why. And I think that's so true. And it, maybe that discovery is an evolution, but I think if, that's, if you're feeling like you're pulled toward horticulture, and obviously you are if you're here, um, go with it. There's no reason why you should feel like that's an inferior uh, occupation. It's incredible. I think it's a great op occupation. And I also think that uh, the biggest complaint I always hear about horticulture is that, well, you know, it doesn't pay that well. The average pay isn't that great. But I've really come to the conclusion that average pay is earned by who? Average people. If you want to do great and, and make a good living and have a good life, then you can do it in horticulture. There's no way. Now, if you want to be average, and you know, how many people do you walk up and say, hey, how, what do you want to do in your life? Oh, my goal is to be about average. You know, so if that's your goal, then maybe you are in trouble. But if, if you want to shoot for the top, 
there is no reason in horticulture you can't have a great career, have a good income, and really enjoy your life. There's no reason you shouldn't. And I remember, I know you're looking at me thinking, this guy's pretty old, you know, but it just seems like the blink of an eye that I was in your shoes thinking, what am I going to do with this degree? It doesn't pay anything. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to make any money. And now I realize that that was, that was so wrong. And I wish someone would have told me that there was a lot of opportunity and I didn't have to find it out for myself. It would have helped me get through some dark times, you know. Okay. I, wanna, I figured being a horticulture student, you guys would appreciate this. You know, where does tree protection fit into the big scheme of things? I did this. This is one of those old wild deals, you know, I might share with my kids and they would share. But I, I think you've got to put ourselves in where does tree protection fit in horticulture? Where is it? And I think, well, it's obviously in the plant kingdom. It's horticulture. It's not agronomy, right? It's really, we're dealing with tree protection. We're dealing with aesthetics, not food. I kind of put it on the landscape management side, not the landscape uh, construction. And then plant protection, which is so much different. It's a little more technical than the general maintenance, in my opinion. And then tree protection as opposed to turf. No, no uh, insult to the turf guys, but I don't really, I just don't enjoy turf. Never have. I love trees. But I know there's a lot of people that are really good at turf. But the tree protection side of it, the most important part, or the most exciting, the one that gets your juices, my juices flowing, is the killers, the tree killers. You know, there's a lot of cosmetic pests out there that do a lot, you know, uh, maybe get honeydew on your car when you park under them, or maybe strip the foliage off your trees, but the trees come back the next year, everything's fine. But the tree killers are the ones that I really enjoy uh, uh, protecting trees against. And why do I call it protection? Uh, there's a scripture there that says what? And it, it, since we've been around, um, what was the last holiday we had? Uh, Valentine's Day? I'm old. <laughs> okay. We don't celebrate that anymore. We've been married 30 years. Okay, so the, um, the, 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 the scripture said that, and if, if you can fill it in here, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast. Remember those? But if you go down through that scripture, what's, what's love always do? Love always protects. That's what it's, that's what they, that's what, that, that's a, it's biblical. You have to do it. So love always protects. If you love trees, you got to protect them. So I really feel like that's, that's my, uh, that's my role. Okay, there's things we have to protect from. Diseases, insects, nutritional deficiencies, growth and structural issues, a lot of root disorders. That's the big hub right now. I mean, everybody's talking about root disorders. And then on the consulting side, which is an interesting career uh, avenue that I think uh, will become more and more uh, prominent as, as time goes on. Trees are getting more valuable, not less, in my mind. In Kansas, you know, you used to have a tree in the way, what'd you do? Just cut it down. Now things are changing. The coasts, uh, the influence of the coasts are coming more towards the Midwest. We want to hold on to those trees. They've been there 50, 60, 70 years. You can't just cut it down. So it's really important to uh, recognize the value of trees. Okay, start with biotic diseases. I'm just going to run through these. I'm not going to go like Colin and get into all the depths of it because he's smarter for one thing. But if, if, you, uh, if you just want a general idea of some of the things that we deal with in the uh, uh, protection realm, these, this will give you a good overview. First of all, I thought it was great again, they're talking about plants. Everything starts with plants. They're the only thing that can take sun energy and turn it into chemical energy, right? There isn't anything else. So if you get rid of plants, you're in trouble. But because they're the only ones that can do it, if there wants to be any other life, what has to happen? They have to steal from it. They have to take from the tree. And these are, these are our major objectives or major uh, opponents. We have fungi, nematodes, some viruses, a few bacteria, but they're always trying to do what? They're trying to steal the food from that cell. And sometimes they s just take a little, and sometimes they take a lot, too much to the point of death. So we're fighting them. Now, which one is the, you horticulture students, which one's the most prominent? Which ones do we have the most trouble with as far as diseases go? Which one of these? Nematodes, fungi, bacteria? What was your guess? Fungi. Fungi is the one. I mean, 90% um, of the time, it's a fungus that you're dealing with. You don't have to deal with bacteria. I didn't even take the bacteria class. I'm thinking, why would I want to do that? There's only two. But fungi, boy, we've got to focus on those. They're after you all the time. OK, this is the one I did my uh, graduate work on. It had the research published on this with pine wilt. I mean, how devastating. A big tree like that, and I think it's kind of interesting that it's in a graveyard, right? <laughs> so we've got these big trees, been there for a long time. 
And within, oh, you know, it could, uh, depends, but this could have been 60 days from the point of infection to death. That's pretty significant and how sad. Uh, this is a younger tree, same, same problem, but this is the guy, this is the nematode that gets in there and feeds on these cells. And this guy spreads, those, spreads it around. Look at those, I always like these little chompers here. These longhorn beetles a lot of times have these big mandibles and they get up there and they chew on the top of the tree. And these nematodes, which is interesting, uh, these nematodes are packed in this beetle. So you have the sick tree, this beetle's in there and that tree flies out and he has all these nematodes shoved in his body in these breathing tubes. And we were talking about how, I think Colin said that, how that poor, poor, poor graduate student had to count all those beetles. Well, I had to count all these stupid nematodes. I mean, they're teeny, teeny weeny. And you have to have them in a, you're in a dissecting scope and you have cross hashes on these uh, one slide. And not only one, but you had, we were doing all these studies repeatedly for five years. So we were, there was a hundred samples and the one, nem, or one uh, beetle can carry up to a hundred and some odd thousand nematodes in its body. It's incredible. So it's a complex disease, but a great example of um, uh, uh, there, are, there was a solution. And our solution was, oh, let me back up. I just, I throw this in here because I always think of my nephew. So my nephew, he's uh, 24 now, and I still remember this Thanksgiving dinner where he said, well, first of all, I went to a school. I'll just give you the abbreviations. It was KU. And he said, you know, I didn't go to K-State because I already know how to mow my yard. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. I mean, I had to give him that. But at the same time, I also recognize how ignorant most people are to the complexity of pathology and of plants in general. It's super complex. We have some of the best minds working on this kind of stuff. And he, his, his uh, degree was in economics. And I told him, you know what? Economics compared to plant pathology is like fifth grade stuff. You know, it, and we had a little battle going on and turned into football and basketball, you know how that goes. But still, regardless, it's an incredibly interesting uh, career. But the way these nematodes work, and this is just a theory. No one knows for sure. So this disease has been around forever and there's all these different theories about the pathology. This one makes the most sense to me when I was working on it, that these nematodes get in. You know, if you punch a pine tree, what do you get on your hand? Resin, yeah. So they get in these, if you were to cut that tree inside there, there's these little cells that have resin in there. And these nematodes get in and start feeding on these parenchyma cells. And then that resin spills out into the tree. And then what do you think is going to happen? Gets plugged up. And there's some other thoughts about exactly, is that the first step, the second step, fifth step? Is it a step at all? No one really knows. Point is, tree dies if it gets them. So what we did is we decided, well, maybe we could inject some chemicals uh, and this happened to be abamectin. It was a, uh, a chemical that was readily available, used for mites usually. But if we could figure out a way to get the chemical into the tree, when this beetle flies in and the nematodes come out after he's made the wounds, if the chemical is there, maybe we could stop it. And, and, and that's what we did. Studied it for 10 years and it, yeah, it did stop it. Um, the, the problem is if you have a row of 100 Scots pines, it's going to cost you a hundred and some odd dollars each tree to inject. And so that kind of limits it a little bit. But for those people that have their own planes, they'll do it. So we, we were injecting those trees, we're injecting trees all over, pine trees all over the place. And so far, I think last count, we've lost three over the last six years since it's been legal to inject. So it works, but it's expensive. But what's interesting to me is there is a problem. That's what's neat about this industry. There is a problem. You come up with an idea, you do research, you figure out a solution, there's a way to get around some of these pests. And that's one like, you just want to put on the chalkboard, we win, you lose. We figured it out. Unfortunately, they still have, it's kind of like K-State and KU basketball. We won one, but it's 42 to two, <laughs> you know? But we'll take it. Okay, uh, Dutch elm disease is another one that we fight a lot. Isn't that a beautiful tree? You're supposed to say, oh wow, right? Oh wow, yeah. Oh wow, dad, that's a beautiful tree. But I just think that's a gorgeous American elm. Um, and Dutch elm disease can take it out in a, in a heartbeat. That's what it looks like when Dutch elm disease gets started. Another complicated disease. But this is a, an example of one that I went last summer to inject this tree as a preventative injection because there are injections available. You get a fungicide inside the tree. You can stop this. I went to inject this tree. And look what I find. It's already infected. I just felt terrible. 
because I was a little behind, like it's normally the case. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this tree's died because of my lack of discipline. But so far, uh, and this is what's involved in this, this, this kind of work, so what we did is we got up and we did some tracing. We found out exactly where the infection was, followed it back through the bark. You can cut a little window, find where the streaking is, do some uh, what we call tracing where you just grunt, you know, just cut into about two years worth of cambial tissue, or um, I'm sorry, xylem tissue, because that's where this disease spread. And we did that in four different places where this infection was, pumped it full of Alamo, and so far, it looks good. We'll see how spring comes along. But that's the fight. That's what's invigorating about uh, tree protection. You feel like you're making a difference. That's a big tree. It's been there for a long time. Oak wilt's another one, very similar. We're always fighting that one. Not so much um, as Dutch elm disease, but it is around, and we do some preventative injections. Injections look like this. Uh, this one's actually an oak. Not, uh, the, the system's very similar, and I think there's some that probably do this treatment. Uh, the system's very similar between oak wilt but all we're trying to do is get this fungicide up into the tree so when whatever brings it in, the fungicide's there and it's able to stop it. And we do quite a bit of, the, of this. Um, the problem again is sometimes price is a restriction. So I have a big American Elm that covers my patio and deck. Uh, it costs, uh, when I used uh, this last year, we pumped in 55 gallons of solution into that tree and the chemical cost was somewhere around $400, I think. And that was me doing it for free, obviously. So it's very expensive. Now, if you break it down over a three-year period, because they're supposed to have three years protection, then it's like, well, maybe that's OK. You know, that's worth $150 a tree or a year. So it's a different, different story. But anyway, it's out there. We don't see it. I mean, this, this field is out there. Tree protection is out there. It just doesn't always get um, a lot of recognition. This is a canker disease that we're fighting all the time on pines. Probably seen this. Diplodia. Used to be called Spheropsis. No, it used to be called Diplodia. Then they, the, they changed it to Spheropsis, and now we're back to Diplodia. So when you tell people, it's just, uh, and they've known this, you say Diplodia, you think you're an idiot because you don't know that it's really Spheropsis. You know, so you just, now I just start calling it tip light. That's the safe way to go. Uh, but this is a problem that uh, we spray for. Um, and unfortunately, this has a canker phase. And that's where we run into trouble. Now we can, I'll show you that here in a minute. And I throw that in there. I guess here's another canker, Botrysphere canker. Is there any solution right now for cankers on trees? Any treatment? And there's nothing. There's nothing there. But another one of my favorite quotes is that history uh, swings on very small hinges. I'm convinced that somewhere, somehow, somebody is going to figure this out. It doesn't seem like it, it should be uh, so impossible. If that infection is getting on, uh, getting on the trunk and making its way in, there's got to be some way that we can solve it. And I think there's a great mind out there that will someday. Maybe it's you. I don't know. It's not mine. <laughs> I'll, be too, I'll be too old. <laughs> right? uh, this is another disease that we treat for on pines, Dothostroma. It's an easy one. to. And this is a stage photo, so this, before you give me a lot of grief about this guy spraying with no gear on, we did take the picture. And, and that is water. We're just trying to good example of our sprays okay and I think sprays are on their way out you know but I've been saying that for 10 years so maybe not but eventually I think you're gonna get in trouble for being around you know especially on commercial sites where the students are going by and you're spraying for apple scab on these it's just it's trouble it's asking for trouble so I still think it's on its way out and some of the new science for bark penetrants where you can mix the chemicals with a penetrant spray on the trunk gets in the vascular tissue and moves its way up there's a lot of promise there and it'll be interesting to see a few years, oh, a few decades maybe from now, what tree protection is like. We do a lot with borers. Interesting, we were talking about uh, emerald ash borer. It's in the same family as this one. Does anybody know what? Just take a guess at this tree, Hort students. What kind of tree do you think this is? It's pretty tough. It's not a very good picture. But it's a honey locust. And that's kind of the, typically the way I see honey locusts. They, they're half dead. <laughs> they're always in trouble, especially with nectaria canker. There's a couple different problems that they have. We're always battling them. But then when they're predisposed, stress for whatever reason, and these borers come in, and this is a relative. This one is a honey locust boar, but it looks very, very similar to the ML ash borer. It's a metallic borer. It's a flat-headed borer. It's in the same family, same genus. So it's, a, uh, it's one that we fight, and we spray uh, trunk, uh, make trunk sprays to try to prevent that 
boar after hatching getting going. So we're, we're fighting that all the time. This is another boar that we fight a lot. Uh, this is ash lilac boar, not to be confused with another ash boar. It's a different one. Um, but I don't know. All, everyone says all ash are going to be gone before too long anyway, so I don't know if that's true. I hope not. Right now we're still trying to treat for this one. Nutrition's a big deal for us. You know, there's 20, I think there's 20 nutrients that plants need, and 17 of them are in the soil, I believe. So in any case, uh, er it, everything should work, but it doesn't always work because this is an example of where the pH in Kansas soils get into out of whack, and we have to, this iron becomes unavailable. Let's say this pH is 8.0. We start losing some of our iron, and manganese is another one. So a lot of times, you can get a tree that, I mean, will die if it's been subjected to a deficiency of one of these nutrients for an extended period of time. So sometimes we have to uh, take some action. And this is a good example of what one looks like with chlorosis. This is manganese on a maple, amber maple. That's what it looks like. Some people think, oh, that's so pretty. Well, it is pretty, but eventually it's going to be dead if you don't do something about it. So we do some, this is a, another example of a, a pin oak. But you can't see, it's not a great picture, but it's not only shade. This side of the tree is pretty green, and this side's light green. But you can get a tree that looks like this. It's really on death's door. And this is a, we use a couple different systems. This is one system where we just inject that chemical, that nutrient, right into the trunk. And they pick it up. And this tree, I wish I had a picture. Uh, maybe I'll take one this summer. It's unbelievable. The thing has been sitting there. The homeowner said, this thing's been sitting there looking like this for the last four years. And now it's at least double that size. And the foliage is dense. So it just, uh, you know, it doesn't need very much, but a little bit of iron will go a long way. So we're, we're a, lot, a lot of times we're fighting nutritional things. We do a little bit of pruning. The reason why I was saying that tree was so beautiful is because we pruned it, right? <laughs> so we do a little bit of pruning. We have a bucket truck. We don't do a lot. We don't do any removals. I tell people we're in tree protection, not tree removal. So we try to stay away from the removal side of things as much as we can. Bring the guys in with these big cranes and all that heavy masculine stuff. We, we kind of stay away from that. We just do the light stuff. Uh, and that's the tree that uh, where I showed you before. Beautiful canopy, Dutch elm, I mean, American elm, Dutch elm disease protection. That tree is a, uh, is a prize tree, and it's right down the road from our farm, so I, I really take care of this guy. I don't want this tree to die. We do a lot of climbing, and again, we should have a hard hat on. Okay, that's what everybody said. Where's your hard hat? Well, we should have it. We, we didn't in this case. Uh, but we do a lot of climbing. I, I love the climbs. Anybody climb? Is there any tree climbers in here? There's a tree climber. Tree climbing is the greatest. I worked in New York for about three years. Uh, when I finished my undergraduate work, I still had the greatest memory of being up in a tree. We, the, truck, well, the bucket truck would go up to 60. You're not supposed to do this, but this is what we did back then. But bucket truck's up to 60. Had to get a little bit higher, so then we'd throw in from the bucket our rope, pull ourselves up. So we were working somewhere around 75, 80 feet. And it was on the ocean, you could see out, and just the mist across. Uh, just that, that memory, tree climbing is a great, um, sometimes you don't get as much done as you should, probably, because of these things. But, and then I was working for somebody else, so I was being paid by the hour, everything's fine. But now I gotta keep moving. But I do really still enjoy climbing, and uh, figure I still have another 10 years or so before that has to drop. Then I'll be back in the bucket truck all the time. Um, and you say, well, pruning, is that really about killers? Well, yes, it is, because this is an ice storm we had a few years ago. You get that much ice on a tree, you've got some problems. Uh, this is a picture from Manhattan just a few years back when we had a tornado that went through. And I want to focus on the tornado side here initially. If you get a high winds and you haven't pruned correctly, you'll lose some trees, no doubt about it. This is uh, an idiot that I know that um, didn't take care of his tree. <laughs> This is my house, okay? So this, I, mean, I was talking to Megan Canelli, who's at K-State, and she said, I don't think I would really share that with that many people in your profession. But the point is, it, I'm kind of a tree hugger, so you're trying to hold on to that tree. And of course, all mechanics, right, their cars don't run very well. So us arborists, our trees aren't in that great condition because we're taking care of everybody else. But this happened, and what's interesting about this tree is I had just ran inside that morning, and it was storming, the dog was going nuts, and I take it out to the, the shop, and I, I'm, run, I'm running back in, and I'm standing in this little court, port, or this uh, screened in porch area here, and I hear this crack, this next like explosion. So I run into the house thinking, oh my gosh, this, a tree's gonna fall over. And then there's this delay, and I'm waiting, and I'm thinking, geez, that's, I guess it wasn't. 
And then I walk back out, and I haven't been there for a split second, and it's whoosh. You know, and it's, these trees are so vulnerable if they're not taken care of. And this, is, this had decay. It had been struck by lightning five years before. I had thought I'd been watching the progression of the decay, but obviously not very well. But uh, tree protection has some ramifications down the line. I mean, lives are at stake, or can be. That's another picture. Isn't that nice? I got to be a pretty good deck builder by the time into last summer. Structural support, we do a lot of this. You can see the defect here in this tree. I mean, the grower messed up here, right, Frank? <laughs> But sometimes we just got to work with what we got. So there's a big, huge uh, oak that's in Kansas City. Obviously, structure failure should have probably came down. But us deciding that we could do something with it, we cable. We had cables. <laughs> there's cables running all over. There's two or three bolts. And that's been 10 years ago with a, some pretty significant storms, so it's still holding. But we do a lot of that kind of work. And we focus on this picture again on the right side. Uh, lightning is also an issue that has to be protected against. Uh, again, no hard hat, but this is me just to prove that I really can do work. But up here, you can see this. We, we've installed some uh, lightning protection in a few trees. And this is just a big copper. It's probably been stolen by now, I suppose. <laughs> but it was there at one time. But you had these copper lines going out to all these different feeds come back in. And we had to, you can only imagine, we had to run copper lines along our cables. <laughs> we got cables all over the place. Uh, you don't see it when it in in, when it's, has foliage. In the, in the winter, it kind of looks a little odd. But the tree's still there, the homeowners are very happy, and we've worked our way through. Here's a good example. Oh, here you go. Here's the cable, and here's one of the, uh, one of the cables coming down from the canopy. That took us about two days to put that in s system in. And you know, you don't see this very often in Kansas, but when I worked in New York, you saw it all the time. We worked on Breyer, Henry Breyer's estate. He had, uh, uh, from Breyer's ice cream, and he had uh, lightning protection on all his trees, and we were out there once a month checking it. Just climbing around, just following the lines, make sure everything's okay. I mean, that seems foreign to the Midwest, but it's not in, uh, the co on the coast. There's a cable coming down the tree, and then we had to run that out. You have to put a grounding rod that goes out X number of feet, or goes down X number of feet, and you have to inspect it. It has to be up to speed. This is another thing we deal with a lot. Um, this is what I was talking about. This is like the thing that everybody talks about right now is all this, this production, growing trees and all the root problems that we have. And, what the nursery industry has done over the last 20 years uh, that's actually opposed to the way trees grow in nature and why we're dealing with all this. And you, there's all different camps. But regardless, a lot of times we're dealing with this. Are you familiar with this? Girdling root, squeezing the life out of that tree. Uh, we deal with that a lot. This is, is this one savable? I mean, can we salvage this tree? <laughs> no way. But at least we could diagnose what the problem is just wrapped in the trees, just trying to grow around it, can't do it, compresses that xylem tissue, you're in trouble. Uh, not a great picture, but we do a little bit of um, a vertical mulching, compactions, a lot of uh, problems that we have these days where you can see the wall's been built. Well, they're, all the contractors, they don't care about trees. And they're running over it 5,000 times with their bobcat, compressing that. doesn't matter if it's wet, dry, or whatever. And now we're dealing with uh, roots that have been compressed, oxygen that's driven out of the soil. It's toxic. And then we've tried different things. There's some new stuff out that we have, and I don't know uh, with these air spades, anyone familiar with those or use them, uh, where they actually blow the soil, you know, loosen the soil with air and put in uh, different systems for uh, helping that soil. We haven't tried that yet. And uh, honestly, most of the times that we do this, our trees still die. But we tried. <laughs> I don't know. We keep trying. Eventually, we're going to get it to work, I think. There's just another picture. We, what we do is we go, we drill down. X number of inches, fill that with organic matter. The idea is to try to get oxygen and nutrients back in that soil, and then hopefully those roots will respond. We also, there's some new chemistry out with growth regulators that you pour on the tree that actually stops the foliage from growing and thickens it up and supposedly produces out more root growth. We do some of that. Um, it's just another piece of tree protection. And then the last, this is again stage photo, but we do a fair amount. It's interesting. This has happened over the last uh, few years. There's a uh, more uh, call for tree consultants. I've worked on um, a couple fire cases. I worked on this next one where this tree fell over on a lady when she was going into her house, um, and they wanted to see if there was negligence involved with the homeowner or with the uh, property owner, and we had to go in and give us give our opinion on the condition of that tree, which is 
it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we probably had a problem and it's been going on for a long time, right? You have decayed roots. Um, but we, uh, you know, sometimes it's appraisals and sometimes they go to court. Uh, I've been involved in four different depositions. And what's interesting about depositions is that when you go in, you think you're the smartest guy that walks the face of the earth. And after the attorney's had two and a half hours of grilling you, you think, oh my God, I'm gonna quit. I don't know anything. I'm such a failure. I was <laughs> like, go home to mom. Mom, tell me how great I am. But it's just really, a, it's an interesting, you get better as you go. You get better as you go, but it does take some, take some time to get comfortable and not take things personal. You know, when you get before, I've had to be on the stand three or four times as well. Get before the jury, it gets a lot better. Because you can, you know, the juries, they're reasonable people. <laughs> not that attorneys aren't, in case you're an attorney. But they're reasonable people and they will listen generally to what you have to say. And they're not trying to, they just want you to be an expert and really feel like you know what you're talking about. And they'll side with you. Both uh, two of the three cases uh, we won and one uh, got thrown out. So, but I'm sure it wasn't my testimony. <laughs> We do, there's, there's formulas for appraising trees. That's the thing I do a lot in Topeka now, uh, where, or not Topeka, but all over, where they're expanding a road. And let's say you had a, a road that's gonna get wider in front of your house and they wanna take your tree and, they want it, and it's a 50 year old oak tree and the city wants to give you 200 bucks. Well, you, that's when you get an attorney involved and that's why I still like attorney, attorneys because they save the public from getting ripped off at times. Bring us in, we appraise it. And usually there's some kind of settlement. It's not enough to go to court, although it can couple West Star cases have gone to court. So it's just to just to open your eyes to tree protection. It's more than just treating. Consulting is there as well with time. This is a fire case. And then the last thing is, you know, we have this little lab, you know, my friends say, you know what you guys are? You're kind of like high tech rednecks. <laughs> and I thought, that's pretty good. I can go with, I can live with that. But tree protection is really it's it you're grounded, but there's a lot of science involved. We work with, uh, we can bubble out the nematodes from the pine wilt, and we do it a lot, and look to see if it's truly Bercephalinchus, if that's really the, the nematode that's there. Um, we do some diagnostic work where we're trying to decide whether it's Diplodia canker or whether it's not. And then if it gets too complicated then, or oh, over my head, then I send it on to Megan or Judy in the diagnostic lab at K-State. They do a great job. And um, so it's just, uh, all I'm trying to get across is in tree protection. It's a tremendous field, and there's all these avenues. It's just where you're going to go. It's like, you know, some days you just feel like you're in a field of diamonds. They're just everywhere. You just got to just pick your, pick your channel and stick with it, and there's a lot of opportunity and a great career there. And I think that's all I have, unless there's any questions.